This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight in Unsolved Mysteries, an intriguing new story. In 1988, an undercover San Francisco vice cop, Lester Garnier, was found shot to death inside his late model Corvette. Eyewitnesses saw two unidentified women with Garnier within moments of his death. Police are still investigating what connection these women had to Garnier and his murder. In Phoenix, Arizona, a 58-year-old businessman named Angelo Desideri vanished from his home. 400 miles away, his car was found ablaze. No trace of Angelo Desideri has ever been found. In 1934, Bill Purinton was forcibly separated from his five brothers and sisters by well-meaning social workers. 50 years later, Bill is still searching for his lost sister, Jackie. In Las Vegas, 16-year-old Kathy Hobbs disappeared. Three months later, police received an anonymous call from a man who may have seen her abduction. They need to find this missing witness. Tonight's cases feature ordinary people thrust into a vortex of mystery, heartbreak, and intrigue. Each one is searching for that vital clue to end a story that so far has no ending. Perhaps you can help. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. July 11, 1988. It was a quiet morning in Walnut Creek, California, an affluent suburb of San Francisco. A groundskeeper noticed a Corvette sitting in a shopping center parking lot. His attention was drawn by the car's driver, apparently napping behind the wheel. The man was not asleep. He was dead. The cause of death was determined to be two bullet wounds. This was an extremely cold-blooded, deliberate killing. The sort of person that would do something like this is extremely dangerous. The victim was identified as Lester Garnier, an undercover vice cop with the San Francisco Police Department who lived in nearby Concord. After the revelation that Lester was an undercover cop, the investigation took on a new dimension. For this reason, the search for Lester's killer was undertaken by both the Walnut Creek and the San Francisco Police Departments. There was very little evidence left at the crime scene that would give us much help in identifying the criminal. We do have a few fingerprints that have not been identified, but we've been unable to find any motive at all for the killing of Les Garnier. Lester Garnier's death touched off a firestorm of controversy when the case became enmeshed in a local political scandal. But through all of this, Lester Garnier's killer remains at large. To those who knew him best, Lester Garnier was a walking contradiction. To his parents, he was a devoted son who lived with them in the home that he provided. To his friends, Lester was a man who lived and loved in the fast lane. But to his partners on the police force, Lester Garnier was first and foremost a dedicated cop who went the distance for his job. Somewhere between the lines of these contradictions may lie the reason why Lester Garnier was murdered. If you wanted to find Lester Garnier off duty, the chances are he would be behind the wheel of his prized 1984 Corvette. Lester enjoyed the good life, but he was not blind to the responsibilities of being a good son Lester was a wonderful son. He always was there for us. 
he gave us security, knowing that if anything happens, he's always there for us. But there was another side to Lester Garnier. Off-duty, he enjoyed a reputation as a ladies' man. Hi, that's a beautiful car. According to friends, this reputation was well-deserved. Lester used his charm on the job as well. His beat was the Mission District, once a quiet residential neighborhood. Today, a low-income area frequented by prostitutes. Lester had worked vice for four and a half years and was at home on the mean streets of the Mission, where he would often dupe prostitutes by posing as a customer. We found that he had made numerous arrests for prostitution. We certainly examined that aspect of his life, and we weren't able to find any connection with our case. We interviewed several of the prostitutes that Lester had arrested and found that many of them spoke highly of him, uh, even though he had arrested them. He wanted to do a good job, and the type of job that he had, he had to make sure he made all the right moves. He enjoyed his job to a certain degree. It was a challenge for him every day. Different people, different situations all the time. Those were the streets that we grew up in. And he felt that he wanted to make the city a better place. And by being a police officer, he was doing that. One of Lester's final assignments would throw the murder investigation into turmoil. In the fall of 1988, Roger Boaz, a local mayoral candidate, pled guilty to charges of having sex with underage prostitutes. Lester had been on stakeout duty at one of the houses in this prostitution ring just prior to his death. The local media attempted to tie the two events together. In addition, there were rumors that some San Francisco police may have been involved in Lester's death. But so far, these rumors are uncorroborated. We did address those issues and did a very thorough investigation, but we found no connection at all uh, between Lester Garnier's death and um, the Roger Boas case or any other matter for that matter. July 10th, 1988, approximately 12 hours before his body would be discovered, Lester left his Concord home to meet friends in San Francisco. Less than 20 minutes later, Lester called from his car phone and canceled the evening. He gave no explanation. Yeah, Steve, this is Lester. Listen, I'm not going to be able to make it to the movies tonight. No. During this conversation, he canceled the meeting with his friends, saying it was getting late. Yeah, maybe some other time, okay? After that, we don't know what happened to him until his vehicle showed up in the parking lot shortly before 11.30 p.m. That time period is very critical. As a portion of our investigation, naturally, we searched for witnesses, and uh, we discovered that uh, there was a carpet layer working in one of the stores late that evening. Um, as he went out to his truck, he heard what uh, sounded to him like firecrackers. It was around the 4th of July, so he discounted those sounds as firecrackers. Shortly after, he looked up and saw two women walking across the parking lot. The women entered two different vehicles and left. The workman described one of the women as being in her late 20s, about five feet six inches tall, and said that she weighed about 110 pounds. The other was described as being in her mid-30s, tall, with a slender build. We also located one witness who was actually driving through the lot. As he drove past the Corvette, he saw a woman open the passenger door and exit the vehicle. He saw her walk around the vehicle and appear to look in the driver's side of the Corvette. It's possible that these were just two separate sightings not associated with each other. However, it's also possible that they are somehow related. Under hypnosis, the second witness helped police to create a composite drawing of the woman. Her appearance was similar to the other eyewitness description. When we showed this to the carpet layer, he felt that this sketch 
closely resembled the shorter of the two women that he saw walking across the parking lot. Who was the blonde woman seen with Lester that night? Could a casual pickup have turned into something deadly? Or was Lester killed as a result of his undercover life? Next, the story of schoolgirl Kathy Hobbs, who vanished on her way back from the Las Vegas supermarket. The anonymous tipster may have seen her abductors. Now he, too, has disappeared. Someone out there is walking the streets killing kids. And they killed my daughter. And before they can kill someone else's daughter, I want them caught. On a recent broadcast, we examined the case of a Florida widow whom we called Mrs. K. She claims that she was romanced and then swindled by a man named Arthur Frankfurt. After a four-week whirlwind romance, Arthur Frankfurt convinced Mrs. K to let him move in with her. Never once was I suspicious of any move that he made as far as to question his character, or who he was, and he was, that he was a liar and a thief. On July 29, 1988, while Mrs. K was at work, Arthur Frankfurt disappeared after allegedly stealing jewelry worth over $4,000, as well as many personal items belonging to Mrs. K's late husband. Arthur Frankfurt is wanted by Florida police for burglary, grand theft auto, and check forging. Authorities believe that he may have victimized over 40 women by stealing their hearts and then taking their cash. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, two viewers called our 800 number to report that they recognized Arthur Frankfurt. The individual said, I know where Arthur Frankfurt is. I'm his ex-brother-in-law. My name's Floyd Meadows. I asked him if uh, he had ever seen this Arthur Frankfurt do magic. He said, yes, he did, and he does it very well. This is one of the keys that I never released to the press or any other media, that uh, Arthur Frankfurt does magic. We received another call about 20 minutes later from a white female. It says, Arthur Frankfurt lives next door to me in Whitley, Kentucky. This was the confirmation call that I was looking for. At that time, uh, I knew we had our man. Two hours later, Frankfurt was arrested at his home in Kentucky by the McCreary County Sheriff and Kentucky State Troopers. He was living under the assumed name James Ferguson with his new wife of two months. During a search of Frankfurt's house, police uncovered several identification and credit cards with different aliases. They also found a handgun that may have been stolen from Mrs. K's home. We got other calls from women that say, yes, I've been married to this man. I've divorced him. He's left me holding the bag. And what I need is for the people that have been victimized by Arthur Frankfurt to come forward. It's time for the public to stand up and say, hey, we've had enough of Arthur Frankfurt. This man has preyed on the public long enough. Las Vegas, the glamorous capital of slot machines, blackjack, and high-stakes gambling. An adult amusement park but just one mile off the strip is another side of Las Vegas, the real world that tourists never see, an ordinary part of suburban America. On the evening of July 23, 1987, 16-year-old Kathy Hobbs was reading a romance novel in her bedroom. At 11 p.m., she decided to walk to the local supermarket to buy another book, just one and a half blocks away. She came out to me and she said, Mom, I'm going down to the store and buy a book. And she said, give me a kiss before I go. And I said, why, I'll be up when you get back. And she says, well, she says, I probably will stop and talk to the kids, so you might be in bed when I get back. So I gave her a kiss, and that was the last I saw of her. Kathy had walked to the store late at night many times. 
Usually her friends were gathered at the apartment complex swimming pool, chatting and gossiping, so Kathy's mother wasn't concerned for her safety. One of the kids would walk down to the store with her. There was no one at the swimming pool that night, so instead of coming home, she decided to go on to the store by herself. Assuming that Kathy would be with her friends, Vivian went to sleep. At 3 a.m., she awoke from a strange dream that at the time seemed innocent, but would later come back to haunt her. I woke up out of sound sleep. I felt like I had been hit on the head. And all of a sudden, I got a very peaceful feeling. And it was, well, it's over now. And I fell back to sleep. The next morning, Vivian discovered that Kathy's bedroom was empty. She still had not come home. Within the first day, we had tracked down friends, uh, relatives, and uh, done a very extensive media campaign on the television with Catherine's picture uh, all day long. At the end of the second day, we were pretty much convinced that uh, Catherine was probably abducted. Kathy's disappearance was a culmination of years of worry for her family. For as a child, Kathy had eerie premonitions that she would die at an early age. She was an isolated, introverted girl. When Kathy was eight, she began telling her friends she would not live to the age of 16. She did not have a happy childhood. Her father and I went through a divorce when she was eight years old. She and her father were extremely close. When she was in the seventh grade, a very good friend of hers died of a heart disease that affected Kathy very much. And that's one of the main reasons we moved to Las Vegas was to give Kathy another chance to get away from that atmosphere and the environment that she grew up in. At first, it seemed that the move to Las Vegas had been the right decision. Even though Kathy remained withdrawn, she did blossom and made some new friends. However, as her 16th birthday drew closer, Kathy's old fears of dying returned. About two months before her 16th birthday, she got very teary-eyed one night and told me, Mom, I don't want to get any older. I want to be a little girl. And I told her, I said, Kathy, we all have to grow up. And, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but we all do it. And she told me, I'm not going to. She didn't think she'd make her 16th birthday. Just before her 16th birthday, Kathy became despondent again. She spent all her time in her room and would not leave the house. On the morning of her birthday, though, Kathy was surprised and relieved to find she was still alive. And she came out of her bedroom, and she said, Mom, I did it, I did it, I made it. And I said, what? And she said, I made 16. I didn't think I'd live to be 16. Now Kathy had a new enthusiasm for life and began making plans for her future. She began to go out again, wanted to continue her education, and started to wear makeup. She planned to train as a hairstylist and open her own beauty shop called Cat's Cuts. Uh, she was ecstatic. She came out, she goes, I made it, Mom. I made it. I'm 16. I did it. I'm alive. After Kathy vanished, the authorities assumed that she had been abducted and issued photos to the entire police department. The local media were encouraged to publicize Kathy's disappearance, and volunteer organizations were mobilized to search for the missing girl. Eventually, one crucial clue surfaced. A clerk remembered seeing Kathy in the supermarket the night she vanished. Store receipts confirmed that someone did purchase a paperback novel at 1117 that night. Apparently, Kathy had made it to the store on Desert Inn Road and Maryland Parkway, but she never made it home. It was late at night, but Las Vegas, as you well know, is a 24-hour town, and people are coming and going to work constantly in this town. And this intersection is a large intersection, uh, widely traveled, and the store is a 24-hour major store. And to have people coming and going from this store and nobody seeing anything was very, very surprising. Nine days after Kathy vanished, hiker Rick Pakut was searching for unusual rock crystals out in the desert near Lake Mead, about an hour from Las Vegas. 
was walking back to the car and was probably 150 feet, 200 feet from the road and was stopped by a very strong odor. Decided to see where it was coming from or what it was. And that's when I found Catherine's body. It was the most horrible thing I'd ever seen in my life. I had to sit down and, and gather my thoughts and, and make sure that what I was looking at was real. When I realized that it, that it was a human body, um, went back to the car, back to Colville Bay Ranger Station, and got the rangers and brought them back out to the site. Within probably 20 minutes of our arrival, we knew it was Catherine. There was no doubt in our own minds that it was going to be Catherine. And it does get very quiet, and uh, you, you can't help but look at it and see your own children and say, for the grace of God, there goes one of mine. Your immediate feeling uh, at the time is to want to run home, grab your daughter by the arm, and bring her to the scene and say, this is why I say, no, you can't go out late at night. Investigators found tire imprints at the scene showing where a vehicle had pulled in, turned around, and left. They also found two rocks spattered with blood near Kathy's body. Tests established that the stains matched Kathy's blood type. The coroner concluded that Kathy Hobbs had died from repeated blows to the head. She was 16 years, three months, and three days old when she was killed. So she made it to 16, but uh, not much after that. But she was right, you know. She did have this premonition. Um, that she wasn't going to live to be an adult. After Kathy's death, letters were found in her room addressed to each member of the family. The letters were dated one month before Kathy's 16th birthday. Dear mother, in the event of my death, you shall get this letter. I hope you live happily, and I don't want you or anyone else to dwell on my death. I love you all very dearly. You were good to me, and nobody else could have been a better mother. Keep me alive in your heart, and don't ever forget me. Love always, Kathy. And she was a very good friend, as well as being my daughter. The most direct route to where she was found would be straight down Desert Inn. On October 24th, exactly three months after Kathy vanished, an answering machine at the Las Vegas Police Department recorded a startling call from a man who may have been a witness to Kathy's abduction. Grab this girl in front of the uh, uh, store on Desert Inn in Maryland. This is a few months ago. I've been out of town for a few months, and I wrote this down because she was screaming, and they pulled her in the car. She's a very young girl wearing a white uh, jacket and the pink pants. And the guy's name, he hollered to him, push her in the car. Her na his name was Robbie. The theory that we have is that she was abducted uh, between the store and her apartment uh, by one or more suspects. Uh, we think she was driven to the lake that night. I believe that she was abducted and killed that evening. The caller reported the license plate number of a car he saw a girl being forced into, but he did not leave his name or phone number. The police checked the license number and discovered it did not exist. The crucial tip came over a year ago, and despite repeated appeals, the witness still hasn't called back. And we need to find out if he possesses any more information, and if he doesn't wish to give a name, uh, that's fine, but we do need to talk to him. Someone out there is walking the streets killing kids. And they killed my daughter. And before they can kill someone else's daughter, I want them caught. When he was eight years old, Bill Purinton was separated from his five brothers and sisters. Today, Bill is 62 and has found all but one of his siblings. Now he wants to find his lost sister, Jackie.
Last December, we brought you a story that began over 40 years ago in war-torn Eastern Europe. In 1945, as Hitler's Third Reich crumbled, refugees choked the highways and rural roads. Karl Dente and his family fled their home in Budapest, Hungary, across the border into Austria. As winter fell and the weather turned bitter cold, the Dentys were forced to live in a boxcar. Life was particularly hard for Karl's five-year-old daughter, Brigitta. A few days before Christmas, all that changed when an American soldier known only as Philip asked the Dentys if he could take Brigitta to a Christmas party given for the refugee children by the Americans. Yes. Yes? Yes, Very yes, good. Christmas, Great. yes. She'll have fun. Though over 40 years have passed since that night, Brigida remembers it as if it were yesterday. Philip made me feel very, very special. Aside of making me feel safe and happy, he made me feel like a big girl. Well, I felt like a princess. It's like someone opened a magic door. I felt like I was in a dream. I never wanted the dream to end. Over the next few months, a deep and caring friendship grew between Philip and the Dentys. Then one day, Philip came to the camp with bad news. His unit had been recalled back to the United States, and he would be leaving immediately. He gave Carl a photograph to remember him by. Though the Dentys never saw Philip again, they will never forget the warmth and kindness he brought their family on that Christmas day so long ago. He brought a big change in our life, Lila happiness, you know, give us back a lot of confidence of the human race. After 11 years of struggle and hardship, the Dentys finally made it to America. For 30 years, Carl and Brigitta searched for Philip. Their only clue was the photograph he left them 43 years ago. Within an hour of our broadcast, Mrs. Pauline Dofty of Augusta, Maine, called our 800 number to say that the man named Philip in our story is her cousin Philip Pelletier. He's a retired postal worker and lives in Hammond, Indiana. We immediately call Carl and Brigida Dente and help to arrange a reunion. On Wednesday, December 28th, 1988, Carl and Brigida's 30-year search for Philip came to an emotional end. Bridget? Yeah, Philip? Oh, yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, I can't believe Bye. it. Uh, Bye. Nice to see you. Well, it's really pretty hard to tell you just how I feel after all so many years and uh, trying to recollect everything that we went through together. You know, it's uh, very hard. It's very exciting. It's uh, almost unbelievable. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sure. Nice to see you. It's, it's something like a, a Christmas miracle, because when he left, I was thinking about it, I ever see him again. And here we go, after 43 years, we're back together again. It's just like a dream cream, too, hard to believe it. Sometimes I had a feeling I'm going to wake up. Because you were five, right, at the time, at the Christmas right. party? The minute that I saw him, I could see the warmth and the happy look on his face, smiling. And like, we really never had lost touch, in a way. Carl, Brigitte, and Philip spent the afternoon looking through photographs that brought back memories of that special time they spent together. We're going to stay with touch. We're going to try to visit each other as, as much as possible. We're going to renew the friendship what we had before. You know, it's, it's a friendship forever. Bill Purinton, a 62-year-old retired New Hampshire businessman, was separated from his family in 1934 when he was eight years old. Back then, his last name was Harrington, and his family was struggling to survive the Depression. Bill was one of six children who stayed at home while his parents were away working. On August the 3rd, 1934, the Harrington children were preparing a birthday party for Bill and his little sister, Jackie. 
the children were unaware that four of them would soon be torn from their family. In the space of a few moments, all of their lives would change forever. The Harrington family lived in the small upstate town of Hartwick, New York. Their neighbors felt that the four youngest children were being neglected. They reported the Harringtons to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The Society took action on the very day of Bill and Jackie's birthday celebration. The social workers arrived when both parents were out working. Despite their parents' absence, the Harrington children's modest birthday celebration was already in progress. As soon as the party was finished, the social workers took the four youngest children away. Bill, at eight years of age, was the oldest of the four. I didn't know who they were, and they told me that I was going to take a trip, and uh, I was excited. I was going to go on a train, I was going to go in a car, and I was going to see things that I hadn't seen before, and, and it was exciting until I realized that I wasn't going home. Then I became angry. I was upset, and uh, that's when I realized that I was not going to see my family again. Bill and his three younger siblings were put up for adoption. They went to four different families in the state of New York. They would not see one another again for nearly 50 years. In 1948, when Bill was 22 and just out of the army, he began the search for his lost brothers and sisters. He made no headway at all until 1976, when he wrote to the records clerk in Hartwig, New York. Just as the clerk was replying to Bill's letter, a chance visitor dropped by. I know her. I know his mother. She moved out in San Francisco. She's living right near her daughter. Would you have an address for her? I do at home. You want it? Oh, that would be great. Bill immediately wrote to the San Francisco address and received a cautious reply from Wanda, his older sister. Wanda just said, I'm Wanda Harrington, and uh, if you want any information about the family, just call me, and she gave me a phone number. And I called her, and she answered the phone, and I said, hi, Wanda? And she said, yes, are you Ed or are you Bill? And I said, I'm Bill, and she started to cry. By 1976, Bill had tracked down all of his brothers and sisters except two, Jackie, the sister who had shared his birthday, and Ed, his baby brother. The feeling of, of knowing that you have a brother or a sister somewhere that you can't locate uh, is the driving force. It, it just makes you want to keep on looking. You don't give up. In 1980, Bill's search got another unexpected boost. Helen Steinman of the New York Children's Aid Society found a phone number for Ed. This is Bill. On Christmas Eve, Bill spoke to his brother Ed well. for the first time in 47 years. You sound just like what I thought you would. When I got the call from my brother, I just couldn't believe that it actually happened. Oh, thank you. And it's just been a great experience to have, all of a sudden, with one phone call, I have 42 new relatives. And being at Christmas time, that was the greatest Christmas gift I could get. Finally, two months ago, the Harrington family reunited. The first time all five of them have been together for more than 50 years.
Ed's wife played photographer, and the brothers and sisters posed for their first family picture since 1933. The Harrington children treasure their reborn family, but their joy is tempered. Their sister Jackie remains missing. When we find Jackie, and it'll be a completed circle, everything will be in its place, and everybody will be where they belong. I've been looking for my sister for the last 40 years, and I intend to find her, and I'm not going to stop until I do. One Sunday afternoon in Phoenix, Arizona, a businessman named Angelo Desideri prepared a solitary lunch. Before he could sit down to enjoy it, he vanished. 30 hours later and 400 miles away, his burned out car was discovered. No other trace of Angelo Desideri has ever been found. On the afternoon of June the 5th, 1988, a prosperous businessman named Angelo Desidari vanished from his Phoenix home. Nobody knows why or to where he disappeared. His friends and family believe he met with foul play. Some investigators think Angelo wanted to disappear. There's no conclusive evidence either way, only questions. The body of Christ. 57-year-old Angelo Desideri was a devout Catholic who had once studied for the priesthood. He lived a quiet, routine existence with his parents in a Phoenix suburb. Angelo was a very ordered, neat individual. Very, very um, meticulous and very, very neat individual. A perfectionist, in, a, in its true sense of the word, a perfectionist. Angelo built a small fortune out of hard work. He had several close friends, but never married. Angelo loved the finer things in life, and he supported this affluent lifestyle by owning a shopping center and an import store. On the morning of Monday, June 6th, a neighboring shop owner discovered that Angelo's store was closed and no one was inside. One of Angelo's friends drove out to his home to see if anything was wrong. And after uh, seeing certain things that disturbed me, like an uh, alarm that was not on and uh, other things of that nature, I uh, went next door and uh, made the decision to phone 911 and bring out a police officer so we could enter the house. Inside, Angelo was nowhere to be found. The house was undisturbed. Apparently, he had been interrupted while preparing lunch. On the kitchen table, Angelo had laid out piles of bills as if preparing to pay them. In the living room, Two new pairs of pants were found near a shopping bag. A receipt inside the bag showed Angelo had bought the pants at 12.47 the previous afternoon. When my brother disappeared on that Sunday afternoon, he left the house with absolutely nothing. He didn't take a toothbrush, a pair of slippers, nothing, absolutely nothing. The only thing that we discovered that was missing was his attache case, some jewelry, and money was missing from the home. But as far as any other personal items, everything was left behind. If we could find out why he left in that hurry, it might give us a clue as to where Angelo is. In the garage, investigators discovered a telling clue. Angelo's car cover lay crumpled on the floor. Angelo was compulsively neat and always folded the cover after removing it. A neighbor fueled police suspicion when he said he had seen Angelo's Cadillac speed off the Sunday he disappeared. It was very difficult to see. Of course, I couldn't see any facial characteristics, and it just appeared to be a person taller than Angelo. It wasn't like Angelo to pull out without acknowledging me. Uh, 
He'd returned from out of town just a few days before. I'd given him his mail, and we spoke briefly Friday night, which was prior to this was on a Sunday. And uh, it just all kinds of questions. You wonder why. There's a missing link, and I wish I knew what it was, and I'm sure a lot of other people do too. At 6.32 on Monday evening, only 30 hours after Angelo disappeared, 400 miles from Phoenix, a 1985 Cadillac was found ablaze in the San Diego parking lot. An accelerant had been used to set the fire. Investigators traced the owner. It was registered to Angelo Desideri. When San Diego authorities examined the car, there were no personal belongings inside. They found no signs of forcible entry. The ignition was untampered with. There were no signs or indications of any hot wiring of any type. Uh, the vehicle was very, very meticulously cleaned. No bugs, no dirt anywhere on the front of the vehicle as if it had just come from a long journey from another state. Washing a car and then burning it is something that is the first for me in my career. I cannot conceive that he would burn the car. It just seems incredible that this is possible of my brother. He's just, uh, it just doesn't seem possible to me. I just can't, I can't comprehend something like this. We looked in the trunk and found absolutely nothing in that trunk that would have been there other than the jack. No carpet, no padding, no spare tire. We processed that vehicle. There were no fibers, there were no hairs. There was nothing in that trunk or anything that we could discover that had been in that trunk. Basically, this tells us that there could have been something in the vehicle that was transported in the vehicle. And when it was taken out, they took the carpet and the padding and wrapped it all in one unit and took everything out of the vehicle, including the spare tire. Phoenix police retraced the drive to San Diego, stopping at gas stations along the way. Nobody matching Angelo's description had been seen. Anonymous credit cards had been used. In San Diego, car washes were checked on the slim chance that someone would remember having seen Angelo. No one had. But authorities did find two witnesses who had seen the car minutes before it was torched. One saw a man resembling Angelo in front of the Cadillac. At the same time, a woman passing by also saw the man. However, neither witness could conclusively identify him as Angelo. We can narrow that down to about five minutes prior to the fire. The results of our case rest on who that person was. Uh, it could possibly uh, close our case if it was Angelo standing by that car. In the disappearance of Angelo Desideri, there are still many perplexing questions. Why would Angelo leave his home in such a hurry without a visible struggle? Who was it standing next to Angelo's car in San Diego? And why was it set on fire? And perhaps most importantly, what was the motive for his disappearance? There is no way, knowing this man like I did, that uh, I can even remotely tie him into any illegal activity with any underworld, or anything criminal, uh, any being involved in anything of this nature that would uh, cause him to have to possibly leave or disappear. There's no way at all. There's another life or there's another dimension to Angelo that we've never been able to find. We have a gentleman who would go out of his way for people, someone who was devoted to his family. And yet, we have this whole case. And all the, all the pieces, they just don't fit. There's a piece missing somewhere. And I think that if, if I could ever find that piece, I'd find Angela. For over eight months, investigators and friends were baffled as to the motive for Angelo's disappearance. Update. On March 16th, Phoenix police charged a local resident, Joe Callow, with conspiracy to commit armed robbery and burglary on Angelo Desideri. They learned that Callow was a friend and business associate of Angelo and had detailed information concerning his disappearance. Joe Callow told us that all the information he had was told to him by James Majors. James Majors had worked with Callow in construction. 
He is currently in a California jail facing several counts of murder. During the interview of, of Joe Kello, uh, he stated that Majors went to the house, uh, got into the house by ringing the doorbell and asking for a glass of water. Uh, then took Angelo at gunpoint and robbed the house. Uh, he was taken out of the house at that time by Majors and driven out into the desert. Callow claims that somewhere between Phoenix and San Diego, Majors murdered Angelo and then placed the body in the trunk of the Cadillac and continued on towards San Diego. The following morning, Majors goes to a hardware store. We're not sure where. We believe it's in some small town between here and California, uh, where he purchased a pick and a shovel. Callow claims that after buying the tools, Majors told him that he had driven down a desert back road to an area adjacent to a rundown house. He then buried Angelo near a large tree. According to Kello, Majors did a real unique thing. And that is, as he's leaving the gravesite, he stopped and gave the shovel and the pick to the poor people that lived in that, that shack. And then he exited onto the highway and drove him to California. Joe Calla also told investigators that Majors had a storage locker. Police searched the locker and recovered property belonging to Angelo. These items were traced back to the Desideri home. Join me next time. Perhaps you hold the key. Perhaps you can help solve a mystery.